Welcome to Spaminar. This is our fourth in our series of online gatherings for live theater prop professionals and anyone interested in stage props. I'm Jim Guy, Properties Director at Milwaukee Repertory Theater and President of the Society of Property Artists and Managers. SPAM is an association of professional prop educators and prop managers from not-for-profit producing organizations with an international communication and support network that shares resources, information, solutions, and techniques, as well as safety issues, continuing education, and stock. We promote the highest professional standards among prop artisans and craftspersons and promote the profession of props to potential prop artisans, working to establish educational standards for the training of artisans. SPAM was formed in 1994 to create a fellowship among prop professionals to address issues of common importance and to create parity with other production areas. We now have over 150 active members reaching from Hawaii to Ireland and Canada to Florida. As with previous prop uh, SPAMinars, we're requesting pay what you can donations to help support this programming and our annual grants for early career prop professionals. If you can't afford to donate, the link will be in the chat during the sessions and we really appreciate any help you can give us. Tonight's presentation is, how do I know what type of mold to use? An introduction to different types of molds and when to use them. Our presenter is SPAM's own Jen McClure, Yale Repertory Theater prop supervisor and lecturer at the Yale School of Drama where she's worked for 13 years. Over the span of her career, Jen has served as technical director, prop master, and prop and set designer, and freelance prop artisan for a number of highly respected professional producing organizations and educational institutions. Our moderator is Stephanie Hansen, SPAM member, associate professor of theater and property supervisor, and resident scenic designer for the resident ensemble players at the University of Delaware. At the end of the presentation, we'll have a short Q&A session. So just write your questions in the chat field and Stephanie will select a few questions to ask our guests today. Be sure to stay to the end of the session to hear about the ever-growing lineup of future Spaminar guests and other ways to interact with and learn from our membership. Okay, enough of that, onto the main event. I am pleased and proud to present my friends and colleagues, moderator Stephanie Hansen and our presenter, Jen McClure. Enjoy. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm coming to you tonight from the shop down at the at the Yale Rep Theater here, um, and uh, I'm really excited. Molds are one of my favorite things to make, uh, one of my favorite things to talk about, and uh, we're going to try to fit a lot of information in just this one hour. But I do know that we're planning on having a whole bunch more uh, in this mold series. So we're going to do a lot of follow up. So if you still have questions and still want to see more, don't worry, there's more mold content coming, which is really great. Um, okay, so firstly, uh, just why should you even make a mold, right? So you would make a mold for a lot of different reasons. You might need multiples of something. Um, maybe the, you need 100 of something for a production and they're really expensive. So you can buy one and then you can spend the time to make a mold and then you can make a bunch yourself if you can cast them for cheaper. Um, sometimes we need things to break on stage so you can make uh, breakables, you can pre-break something or you can actually buy breakaway uh, materials but that might be a reason why you might make a mold. Um, you might need the shape of something, but then need it in a different material. So we do this a lot in fight combat. We make uh, foam props of, of uh, actual things like swords and frying pans and all kinds of stuff so that they're safer when we use them in fight combat. Um, and then also you just might need something that's lighter weight. Either it needs to be carried on or thrown around the stage, or maybe there's a lot of decoration on a flying wall and it needs to be really lightweight. So you might replicate something that's either hollow or made out of foam instead of metal or whatever the final cat, the, the real thing was. So that's a whole bunch of reasons why you might make a mold. Um, before we get into talking about the actual molds themselves, I'm just gonna go over some keywords and terms so that we're all on the same um, starting point. I know that there's a lot of folks here that are different uh, skill levels and different points of their mold making journey. So I just want to make sure that everybody knows kind of what I'm talking about as I go through. So uh, a positive is the thing that you're making a mold of. So let's say, you know, this thing I was going to make a mold of this. This is my, my positive. So the thing you start with, but then also the thing that you pull out of the mold is your positive. 
Conversely, the negative is the mold you're making. So the negative has this negative cavity in it. So that's your, your negative of your positive that you make molds. Um, an undercut is anywhere that the mold sort of turns away from you when you look at it. So an easy way to think about it is like if there was a horizon line, anything that sort of crests the horizon line and starts to dip over it, that's the, an undercut. Um, and you want to uh, just identify those type of things on the thing that you're making the mold of. There's ways to work around them and ways to form your mold around those undercuts, but you don't want to make a mold that's going to sort of lock on and then not be able to pull off. Um, so they're definitely something to keep an eye out. So for example, this is a, a sculpture that I made that we cast um, a couple years ago um, uh, of Rosa Parks. So there's a few undercuts in this mold, sort of under, under the nose would have been a problem inside the ear, because when we look at this from the front, there's you know still some space inside this ear. Inside this collar, there's a little bit of a dip. So all of those are potential undercuts in places that the mold might get stuck. And I'll show you how we work around those things. Um, a parting line is just where your mold comes apart. So sometimes you might have a one part mold and we'll look at those. Those don't have a parting line at all. They're just one piece, but you might sometimes cut your mold apart. And so the sides of the, the mold or the parting line or for two part molds, things like this, you know, this is the, the parting line of the mold. But you can also start to look around things that you uh, want to make molds of. And if you're into mold making, you'll start to really investigate things that you've got around you. And you'll start to find these little um, sort of history lines of how things were made. So you can kind of see this funny line down the side of this. And this was most likely the parting line of how this thing was cast. So this was probably two pieces that um, uh, released top and bottom this way. This is a little tea strainer, my mana tea. Um, but you can see this little line along here that kind of goes over the top of the fin. And then there's one that just like goes up around the front of the, the head. That's the parting line of the mold. So even in industrial made things, you know, that, that history, that, that manufacturing mark is still there. Um, here's a little uh, mermaid. This was sent to me by uh, fellow fellow mermaid lover Kate Dale and Sam member, um, but this she's got a little line that kind of comes across her arm, and then there's another line that kind of comes down her tail and goes along along this edge. So that's where the mold is going to separate. So that can help you if you're making a mold of something that was already molded, a, a pre-made thing. You can just look for that mold line and follow that. But if it's something that you've sculpted, you're going to have to determine where that mold line is yourself. Um, so you want to try to figure out where that is, and that's going to um, inform some of your choices later. You've also got your support shell. So some folks call this a mother mold. Your support shell is often something hard and rigid that supports your floppy rubber mold. So a lot of times we're trying to save money and not uh, not use a ton of rubber. This stuff is expensive. This stuff isn't as expensive. So if we can make our mold and make it kind of thin, but then support it with something rigid so that it doesn't flop all around, that's a support shell. Um, and then keys. Keys are what hold your mold together. So even in a mold like this, this is a one part mold, this has little keys. You can see these little uh, knife marks here and these little things on the corners that sort of lock it into the, into the edge of this and make sure that it stays put. So you can have mold, uh, keys on a one part mold. You can have keys on a two part mold. See all these little nubs here. They're sort of negatives on here and then positives on this side. So those put this together and then they basically make the mold not be able to move. So I can't shift this top to bottom and I can't shift it side to side. That's what those keys are helping lock this together. So it doesn't shift and move when you're molding. Okay, so then starting out. So how do you choose what type of material to even make your mold out of? So a general rule of thumb is if you're going to have a rigid positive, then you should try to use a flexible negative. And if you have a flexible positive, your final thing is going to be flexible, then you could use a rigid mold. You could also use a flexible, but it's kind of whatever your positive, your final item is going to be. Uh, and also what you're making your mold of, your, your initial positive, then you should use the opposite of that. Um, mainly because the, the alpha of something rigid, you know, a flexible mold is easier to release. Um, that ceramics breaks that rule a little bit and I'll show you kind of how that is because 
um, most clay things are cast in plaster molds, which are rigid. And then, um, but uh, when you cast ceramic things, you pour liquid clay in and then it shrinks just a little bit and that's how it releases from the side of the mold. Um, so you can get away a little bit more with the rigid mold, but you have to really make sure that your uh, pieces release well around all your undercuts with the, with the hard molds. Um, so things to consider uh, about you know, making your mold. So first, just what is your initial positive made out of? So if you have something like a sculpture that you've made, um, this was originally cast out of water-based clay, so I had to choose a material that would uh, that wouldn't react to, to water. Um, you know, or if I was making this, this is like a latex rubber, so I'd want to make sure that I use something that didn't react to latex. So um, there are some some things like liquid, like water latex and sulfur that can cause your uh, mold rubbers and things to not cure. It's called in inhibition. So if your mold is inhibited, it's not going to cure and it's going to stay gummy. So you want to try to make sure that you're using a material that works well with whatever it is that you're actually casting. Um, so again, moisture content is something to consider, sulfur content. A lot of sculpting clays, uh, like Sculpey clay, believe it or not, um, or uh, some oil-based clays still contain sulfur. Uh, they don't really smell like it anymore. They used to smell a little bit stronger like sulfur, but they, they don't as much anymore. But there are specific sculpting clays that usually say on the labels um, that they don't contain sulfur. So there's a, an oil-based clay called Chavant that they make um, an NSP, a non-sulfur plastiline clay that uh, you know doesn't have sulfur in it. So if you know that you're gonna be making a sculpture um, that you're casting, make sure that you're choosing not just some random clay off the shelf, that you're using a non-sulfur clay. You wanna also consider in the thing that you're gonna be casting, um, the material you're casting, is it gonna heat up? Um, you know, different mold uh, rubbers and, and materials can react to heat differently and they might start to break down after um, after a while if they're exposed to, to high heat. So some casting resins produce heat when they're, when they're curing. So you wanna make sure that the resin or the rubber or whatever mold material you pick can hold up to that. Um, there are different materials that can, that can take high temperatures. There are uh, some rubbers that you can get that um, you can cast pewter and low temperature um, uh, metals into, but there are other, other you know, higher end materials, uh, sort of ceramic based materials that um, you can use to cast bronze and aluminum. So there are different options for any type of thing you're using. You just need to make sure that you're using the right thing. You also want to think about the durability of your final positive that you're pulling out of your mold. Um, if your thing is a big solid thing like this, you might be able to have a tighter fitting mold because you can kind of wrestle it around. If your uh, final product is going to be something really, really thin, maybe a shell or, or something that's um, is a little more delicate, you'll want to consider maybe you make a two-part mold so you can pull the mold away from that final thing a little easier. So think about the thing that you're pulling out. Is it going to be um, strong and durable so that you can kind of wrestle it out of the mold or are you going to have to really delicately take the mold off of the final cast piece? Um, and then the other thing you want to consider is uh, are, are you doing anything that has contact with human skin? So you can also do different castings uh, on people's bodies, body parts, hands, faces, really anything in, in someone's body. Um, and uh, there are specific products that you use for that. You can't just use any anything random. There are specific ones that are formulated to uh, to, to not cause irritation and also be safe for, for human skin contact. They usually cure a little faster so that whoever it is that you're your mold subject isn't uh, uh, stuck in a mold for an hour or 12 hours. Um, uh, but you may want to make sure that you're, you're choosing something specific for that. Okay, so then uh, suppliers. So I'm going to be talking a lot about Smooth-On products. Um, Smooth-On is uh, one, one of the, the you know, big companies out there that makes these, they, they, you know, they sell their stuff in these nice yellow and blue containers. So if you see these around, you know that that's uh, smooth on stuff. Um, they have a, a huge product line that goes from just um, entry level mold makers up to high, uh, uh, high industry professionals and, and um, folks that are making, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of parts. So um, they have a, a lot of different varieties and a lot of different price entry points as well, which is really great. Um, 
So uh, I also really like that that their customer service is really wonderful and their folks that answer the phone when you call them or that work in the stores. Anyone that works for them uh, has to use their products. They every month have to do a project for themselves. And so um, they really honestly have hands-on experience with their products. And so I often will call them and say, hey, I'm, I'm thinking about using this material for this. Is that the right thing? Um, and they'll say, you know, oh yeah, I've done that. Or, you know, hold on, I haven't used that as much, but the person who's sitting next to me has, let me give you to them. Um, they don't try to upsell you on, on, you know, using a more expensive thing. They'll sometimes even tell you, you know, you can use this other thing that's cheaper, which is really helpful. Um, so that's really great. They have a lot of different uh, suppliers around the, the country. So their distributor is a company called Reynolds Advanced Materials. And so you can look for them. We'll put a link to them in, our, in the show notes. Um, and uh, they have distributors all over. So one of the reasons that I use them specifically, I'm in, I'm in Connecticut and there's a distributor in Boston. So if I place an order by like five o'clock, it goes in the mail that day and I get it the next day, which is incredible. Um, so, uh, you know, depending on where you're located, that might inform what distributor you want to use. Um, another one that, that's a big one in uh, California that serves the movie industry a lot is a company called Berman Industries. Um, they're based in LA and they service a lot of the movie and special effects industry out there. There's a Texas based company called Brick in the Yard Mold Supply that has a lot of different options. Um, and then there's stuff that you can just get at the, at the craft store. So places like Michael's or, or Joann's or your local craft store, um, you can get stuff like this. This is a company called Activa. Um, uh, but there, there's a Luma Light is another one that you can get at a lot of local places. So you don't have to use this fancy stuff. There is stuff that you can get if you just run to the craft store often. Um, and, uh, you know, you just might not be able to, to get gallons of it there. But if you just need to do a small project, you can get stuff locally as well. Um, so check to see what, uh, what you've got locally in your stores. Okay, so then uh, materials. So we're gonna, you know, what, what materials should be used first? So flexible materials, um, you can make a mold just out of regular latex. Um, so here's, a, this is Holden's latex. Uh, I think Smooth On recently acquired th this company. This was a, a latex company for a long time. This is actually casting latex, but they make mold latex too. So there's different latex formulations. Um, and they're just, some are a little thicker and some dry a, a little less um, uh, fast and that kind of thing. Some require you to actually heat them. Um, vulcanizing is what that's called, uh, uh, post, post molding to, to sort of cure them a little more. Um, but you can just take latex and just brush it onto something and make the mold that way. Um, and that's pretty easy, you know, so if you had this, it takes a long time because you got to build up a whole bunch of layers. Um, you could like put some fabric or something in there, but you could use something as simple as latex if you don't need to go the, the silicone route. Um, it's not as durable. Latex over the years tends to dry out and shrink and crack. So, but if you just need something, something quick, you can totally use that. That's absolutely a, a valid, um, a valid option. Um, and then there are different types of rubbers. So there's urethane rubbers. Urethane rubbers are sometimes a little bit cheaper than silicones, um, but, uh, but they tend to, you have to be a little more careful about what you're putting them on because they can stick. So you have to use a mold release or some sort of um, coating on your, on your sculpture or your uh, positive to make sure that it doesn't stick to the, the mold material. Um, but uh, what most people use are silicone rubbers. And so there are two types of silicones. There are tin cure and uh, platinum cure. I could probably talk for about an hour on what the differences to those are. And, and uh, I'll put a, a couple of links in the, again in the show notes of what the major differences are. But the big things are is that um, platinum, cure, so platinum silicones will not cure at all if sulfur is present in your um, in your sculpture, so you have to be really careful about that. Um, but they do have a really long library life. So meaning that if you want to make something and you want to have it for the next 10 or 20 years to keep making molds of it, then a platinum silicone is a good way to go. Um, tin cures can still um, last for maybe five years or so, but they just have a slightly limited um, more library life. Um, they can also just shrink a little bit over time. Um, so you have to be careful about if you are in 10 years, again, going to go and make something um, 
uh, you know, what, what's the, it has it shrunk and do you need it to fit back into something? So um, I tend to use platinum silicones more often, um, again, just because I've used them a lot and I, I uh, know how to use them and it's products that I'm familiar with. But again, you try stuff and every, every job is different. Um, okay, so then you have rigid materials. So that's kind of flexible, uh, flexible materials. So then you've got rigid materials like plaster um, or epoxy and fiberglass you can use to make a mold on the outside of something. Um, and then you've got single use things. So like alginate, if anyone's ever been to the dentist and had impressions of your teeth made at the dentist, that's um, alginate that it's made actually from algae. So it's a natural material. This is one of the things that's good for use on, on skin, but it's only good once. It mixes with water. It's a the powder material that mixes with water. Um, but then once it starts to dry out, it starts to shrink. So you can, if you're really careful, um, keep an alginate mold, but also it's really brittle. So if you try to stretch it and, and uh, get your, your mold positive, out of the mold, it most likely will break. So usually we think about alginate as a one-time use um, mold material. However, it's really cheap. So it's really good for if you uh, don't have a lot of money and you just need to do something fast, it cures really fast and it's real cheap to get. Um, and it's also great to play with to just kind of uh, get yourself into the world of mold making because it's not that expensive. Um, okay, and also because alginate mixes with water, you can use that on wet items. So that's a good uh, idea of if you're trying to make a mold of something that has a high water content, you can make that mold with alginate. And because it's mixed with water, water doesn't uh, inhibit the curing of it. Um, and one of the other things that, that uh, folks used to use, um, uh, oh, I didn't write the name down and it's totally falling out of my brain. Um, but there was another type of like, sort of like heating, you could kind of like heat it up. It was like a mold rubber and you could like heat it. And then uh, uh, you could, you, you know, you could reheat that and, and use it, um, but uh, you had to use it when it was hot. So you could use this on skin, um, but you had to get it to like the perfect temperature. Um, so uh, uh, it, uh, I see Abby saying it wasn't like wax. It was, it was some sort of like rubber that kind of like re, re melted. Um, I can't believe it. Moulage, there we go. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, was a product called Moulage. So uh, you could use this to, to, you know, make castings of faces and then reuse it. But um, I don't know that really anybody sells it much more. Um, but again, it was like alginate. It, it broke when you tried to kind of tear the mold apart. So it was really only good for one use. But the nice thing was, was that you could take all those pieces, melt them back down and reuse it again. Um, okay, so now let's start talking about different types of molds. So first we've got block molds. So block molds are just one part molds. So here's some plaster block molds. These are open face molds. So these are super, super basic um, that you would make if you had a positive that kind of had a flat back that these are great for like decorations that you stick on a wall, molding details, any of this kind of stuff. Super easy, you can just put this flat down, make a little box or container around it, pour your material on top, and then be able to then basically have an open face mold like this that you could put anything in. Um, these are plaster molds and we use these a lot because we make then latex um, ornaments to put on furniture and sculptures and, and um, around mirrors and decoration. And, and what's nice is that the plaster, because it's porous, sucks the moisture out of the latex, and then you can uh, keep using this for, um, for latex molds. So these are great, super cheap. You can get plaster at, at the you know, home improvement store. So that's pretty great. Um, but plaster molds are uh, really rigid. So they're not good for things with undercuts. And if you start to get something with a lot of surface area, sometimes it can be a little tricky to get your item out. Um, I've made some with, with wooden uh, decorations that I've then had to like pry them out. So you sometimes need to seal the surface of your casting. So for example, this was a, a metal ornament. So um, even though this was metal and the plaster isn't going to really soak into the surface of this, I would have put something like Murphy's oil soap or a little bit of um, wax or something on the surface of this Vaseline maybe to, uh, to release this so that it would come off easier. 
Also, when you're choosing your mold release, you need to make sure that there's nothing in the mold release itself that's going to inhibit your, your uh, molding material. So, you know, Vaseline and Murphy's oil soap um, are, are pretty popular ones, but some materials uh, those can inhibit. So you just want to double check that those are okay to use. Uh, uh, smooth on sells um, a couple spray mold releases, and they also sell a couple waxes that you can use as well. But there's stuff you can get by yourself. So these are just block molds. Um, here's another one that's made of silicone. So this is a pretty dense silicone. This is Mold Star 30. So this is a really strong um, dense mold rubber that doesn't have a lot of flex to it. So this doesn't need a, a mother mold, a support shell, because it's strong enough to just sit on the table and just cast by itself. So here's a little casting that came out of this. This was just uh, um, epoxy resin that came out of that. So block molds are pretty easy. You can also use silicone like in a tube that you get from, from the hardware store. Um, there's a few recipes that you can find online for this, um, that you take the silicone and you mix it with a little bit of cornstarch and you can put a couple drops of food coloring in it. And by adding just that little tiny bit of water, it helps the silicone cure faster. So these are a couple just really cheap little press molds that I made that were just silicone and uh, a couple drops of food coloring and some cornstarch. They're not as flexible as the nice, um, uh, as the commercial products. Um, and, and they got a little bit of detail, but they weren't as easy, but this kind of went on like a putty. So you can also uh, find these that you kind of apply as a putty and you just press them on. So you can do that. Again, you can get the stuff from just the regular hardware store if you really need to make a mold quickly. Um, okay, so other one part molds. So here's uh, this maybe wants to go with our brush on section. And that one too. Okay. So here's a couple other than, than block molds. So now we're going to start to look at some one part molds, but that then we've had to cut up. So this was like a mold of a grapefruit. Why? I'm not sure, but we have a mold of a grapefruit. Um, so this was just a. Uh, uh, molded in one piece because we knew we could get it out, but because it sort of curves up at the top, we wouldn't have been able to pull this thing out. So we had to cut it on the edge. But again, we didn't have to make a full two part mold. So this is a nice technique sometimes where you can make the one part mold um, and then just cut it open and be able to do this. One part molds are great because they're fast. They only have, they're only one part. You mix your, your mold material and pour them and then you're done. Um, and depending on the material that you pick, you can, you can have it cure um, in just a few hours. So uh, Smooth On's Mold Star, the, the 16 is the fast. So 16 refers to the, the durometer, the, the squishiness of the rubber. Um, there's 16 fast, I think, cures in like 90 minutes. So you can make a mold and later that day start pulling, pulling sculptures out of it, um, uh, which is really great. So that might be uh, a reason to do it. The downer about these is that they waste some material. So, you know, this is kind of round. This is just about the same size. So we made it pretty close to the size. So you kind of want to try to make your box uh, when you're making block molds as close as you can. You still need about half an inch, three quarters of an inch on all sides to make sure that it's strong enough. But uh, but sometimes these can be wasteful if your sculpture is really kind of all over the place, if your positive is a weird shape. So we'll look at some, some ways to do that with uh, different techniques. Here's some other just one part things. So uh, this was a student made a mold of a shrimp. So we have this very high tech um, support shell here. So if you can make your molds in containers and then be able to put them back in that container to, to cast them, then that's great. You don't need a support shell. Um, so, you know, I love doing that with just little paper cups um, because then uh, it's helpful. So this was just a mold of a, of a shrimp, a literal shrimp that we bought from the grocery store and made a mold of. So these mold star rubbers that I like to use a lot uh, uh, also don't inhibit with liquid. So that's really nice. So you can cast things that are wet. Um, and this was one of, the, one of the ones that cast really quickly too. So it doesn't really have time to get messed up. So again, this one kind of was like uh, cut open. And you'll see when these are cut open, we usually try to cut them in a little bit of a Z shape so that it kind of zippers itself back together when, uh, when you're trying to put the mold back together. So then when it finds its way um, back together in the cup, that 
keys it back together. So these little, this shape of this cut acts as a key and makes the mold not be misaligned when you're, when you're pouring it. Um, here's a couple other ones. So uh, my husband and I like to, like to, he modifies um, toys a lot and, and gets different toys. So here's like a, this was a mold of a leg of like a stormtrooper leg. But so we were able to make these. What's nice about this is that we didn't have to put a pour spout on this. The bottom of the foot, because it was flat, could be the top of the mold. So then we just poured, pulled down this. But again, this didn't have to be a two-part mold. Um, we just had to cut down the side. And now we have both legs in the same mold. That's pretty nice. Um, here's kind of another version of that. This is like the top of a little, of a little body. But you can kind of see when you cut these, you just cut them until you, you can release your thing. Um, so the downer about doing this is that if you do this, you know, hundreds of times, this seam is going to start to, to creep down and not be um, super good. So, you know, this is great if you need to make maybe a dozen of something or even just a few of something. Um, but if you had to do this a lot of times, you would want to take the time to make a two part mold because that would actually um, uh, come apart and, and not risk damaging the mold by pulling on it so much. Okay, so those are one parters. Let's start to look at some two parters. Okay. Let me just make sure that I said everything we needed to say about block molds. Yeah, okay, so block molds are really good for simple shapes that, that um, can be pulled out of the mold really easily. So that's also, you know, this really simple shape has a little bit of texture on the on the front. Um, you know, this has a lot of texture on the front, but a completely flat back, and also no undercuts in any of this. So this was a really easy shape to, to be able to make. Um, so things that start to have a lot of twists and turns, that's where you start to need to think about different uh, different types of molds, like multi-part molds. So this was a demo that I did for. Um, one of my classes this spring. So I just had this, uh, this bottle opener. Um, but because of these holes here, if I were to try to make uh, a one part or, or a block mold on this, that mold would get all stuck inside of here. And, and then how would I release it? So I mean, I could cut it, but it's more reliable when you've got holes and things to make a two part mold. So this is the, the two part mold for that. Um, I put a little shell up over the, the, the top of this. Um, just when I made it to make it a little different, but it still had the holes in the arms here. So you can see from this mold that uh, there's keys here. So you can see the negative and the positive side. And the keys were made just in a little, um, you build this up with a, with a bed of clay, and then you can carve those in. I'm sure that we're going to do some demos later on with actually putting one of these together um, so that you can see these. But the, it takes more time than we have in just this hour to go through all of these, but we'll definitely look at these later on, don't worry. Um, this has some little vent holes to let the air out, so you can see that there's a little vent that travels up here. And then again, just these long keys just kind of help keep this together. So when I cast this though, I didn't put a full support shell on this, but when I would make castings of this, sometimes you can just use a rubber band or something to, to keep your two parts together. Um, but uh, sometimes if the mold rubber is too squishy, the rubber band can deform your mold. So when I cast this, I actually put two pieces of wood on the outside and then I just put a clamp on them to hold these together and that kept the, the mold together. This is another two part mold. This is actually a mold rubber that um, this is super dense. So you can kind of see I can't even like squish this a lot. It's kind of squishy where it's where it's thin, but where it's thick, this is like a really dense brownie or something. Um, but this is a mold rubber that Smooth On makes that's actually strong enough to take high temperature heat castings. So we were repairing one of our guns this spring and uh, our props associate Zach Faber made this mold and cast some pewter into this. So this is a, a high temperature um, product that they have that could actually hold up to the, the temperature of casting molten pewter into it, which was nice. So again, you've got the little keys on the sides and then the two part mold just because it had a little, um, uh, it had a hole through the top. So it was better to make the two parter for that. Um, 
here's uh, this was sort of the, the top and bottom of some stormtrooper armor um, that, that we made in, in two parts. But you can see the keys for this. You can kind of use funny things for the keys. Let's see if we can get this to focus. Maybe. Oh, wait, we can go to my detail camera. So the detail of this is that these keys are actually little miniature dice. So you can use anything that you've got. So we've made this just on a flat board and then just glue, hot glue these little dice to this. And then uh, and there's the negative side in here. So you can be creative with your, with your keys and then that puts itself back together. Okay, so then you can make like super, super tiny. Maybe we should keep the detail camera out here for a second because here's some really tiny um, two part molds. So this you can see based on my finger is a little tiny airplane. <laughs> so this was a little tiny molded airplane from a mold set. Um, and this one, uh, again, we made a two parter because this was so, th these wings are so thin. And they're very, very flimsy. So if we tried to make a one part mold and tried to cut this out of, out of there, we might have broken the wings. So it was easier to be able to open this up and be able to pop this out. The other thing that we did with this, let's see if I can focus this a little more. The way we cast this, because it was so small, was we just kind of glopped some of the mold resin into both sides and then just sort of squeezed it together. And, uh, and, and squeezed out any extra and then had to trim that little extra flashing line off. And then this is like the smallest two part mold that was a tiny little accessory gun for a figure. And so that little tiny accessory gun went on this little figure. And there's a little tiny magnet in his belt and in this piece that locks it onto there. So, but this was a, a weird, uh, show from the 70s called Space 1999 that didn't make action figures. And so uh, my husband made action figures of these characters and sculpted all of their accessories. Okay, so then those are some two-part molds. Here's an actual ceramic production two-part mold. So this is actually a plaster mold. And so this would be if you were uh, in a ceramic studio actually making something, this is uh, an actual you know, plaster plaster mold for ceramic casting. Um, so uh, this would have been put together and then the pour spout for this is actually here. So you would cast this this way, pour the, the clay in. And so this has to be made so that, um, you know, you have to be careful that you don't get uh, air bubbles in this. So you would have had to pour the plaster in, kind of plug this and then kind of slosh it around to make sure that there wasn't any air bubbles in your, um, your uh, in your skin there of your of your ceramic, but you can use plaster for other things too. So here's a plaster mold that I made of a gun that we made a rubber gun for a show. Again, two parts because of this hole in here, and also because we knew we wanted to actually make it out of latex. Um, this was again just a demo for a class, but you can see the keys on there. So little bumps for the keys that hold this together and then lock that in place. Okay, so those are two part molds. So two parts, again, great for um, detailed items that start to have holes in them. Um, uh, it also provides access to the mold interior. So if you want to, this is a mold of literally some chicken from the store and we had to make some chicken breasts for a show. Um, but the nice thing is, is that this opens the mold up. So if you want to do anything to the, the cavity in here, to the negative uh, surface before you make your casting, sometimes you want to apply um, powders or, or colored pigments. You can also pre, um, uh, you can pre prime your pieces. Sometimes uh, the, the plastics and things don't like um, paints to stick to them. So you can actually spray 
primer into your molds and then put them back together and pour your casting resin in. And then that primer bonds to the surface of your casting so that they're basically pre-primed, which can be really helpful. So when you are able to open up both sides of your two-part mold, that gives you more access to this. So that might be a, a choice of why you want to be able to open both sides of this. Uh, uh, and also it's uh, uh, a little easier to add air vents so that you can you can get um, your air bubbles to escape. One of the big things that I'm sure we'll talk about when we talk about actually making these molds is getting the air bubbles out of things. And a lot of things you'll see this has a little air vent here and here so that, the, that it doesn't get a bubble here. Okay, so then uh, brush on molds. So these are quickly becoming one of my favorite type of molds to make. Um, I really like brush on molds because they save a lot of money and um, you, uh, you, can, you can have them be really, really versatile, but you don't need to use a lot of rubber to make them. So this is a brush on mold that I made of a little footlight shell. So here's what's great about our brush on molds is that you can have this really, really thin, um, you know, really thin shell and then just have it supported by something and not use a lot of material. So typically you would have your, your positive and then you would you know, just brush this on. Um, there's different thickeners that you can add to some of the, the mold silicones to do this. Uh, Smooth On specifically makes a product called Rebound that, that is their sort of brush on rubber, but you can use uh, almost any of their silicones um, if you uh, if you do it correctly. So you can thicken their silicones. Um, they have a thickener called Thyvex, and you can add that to most of their silicones, and it sort of turns it into a little bit of a paste or um, sort of sort of like frosting. Um, so you can you can put them on vertical surfaces and, and have them be a little thicker when you're applying them. So brush-on molds save a lot of material, but they take a lot of time to make because you have to do multiple layers. You can't. Um, uh, you kind of have to do one thin layer first to make sure you're capturing all your detail. Then you add maybe two or three thicker layers and you want to get your mold material up to about three eighths of an inch, half an inch max. Um, so it takes a few layers. And then you usually want to do a final layer that we call sort of the beauty coat that, that smooths it all out. Because if there's a lot of texture in here, then it's going to add a lot of texture into your support shell and you don't want that. So you'll notice I put some little pieces um, of some of this rubber onto here as keys and then made the, the support shell for this. This support shell was made of uh, another smooth on product called Freeform Air. This is one of their sculpting putties, but it's super, super lightweight. So that's really great because plaster is heavy, um, but this was super lightweight. You'll also notice that I'm with these kind of little sled um, feet onto here because this was curved, but I wanted this to sit flat on the table. So you can kind of see that those little feet help this sit flat when we cast it. Um, otherwise, if this was round, it would kind of be working all over and we'd have to put shims underneath or something to stabilize it. So if you can add little feet in, I didn't want to make the whole base of this a square because then it's wasting material for my, my support shell. But by adding little feet like this, it helps your mold stand up. Um, here's another brush on mold. This was a sculpture that a student did a couple of years ago. This has a plaster uh, support shell. So even though this is a one part mold, you'll see that the support shell is two parts. So even if you're, you're uh, saving time by making your one part of your, your final thing, you still might have your support shell be in separate pieces. Um, and this is an easy two part separation, but we'll look at some that are more. So this one, you can kind of see all these colors when you're brushing on a brush on mold. It's helpful to add colorant to each layer as you, um, as you make it so that uh, you can stretch these easily or, or, or not stretch, so you can tell the, the layers. Um, but also this is a material that stretches really easily. So this is uh, actually dragon skin, which is used for prosthetics and that kind of stuff, but you can also use it as a mold material. So we knew that this sculpture was going to have to really be like super stretched to get out of here, but this is super tear resistant and we were able to almost like, you know, flip this thing inside out uh, because it's so squishy. So that's 
What's nice about two part molds or, or brush on molds. And I guess you could sort of say that, that a, you know, face castings are sort of a brush on mold as well when you're applying this, um, these type of, you know, this body double is, is the smooth on equivalent of this skin safe silicone. But when you're putting these on someone's face, this is, you know, also a brush on technique that you're kind of smearing it all around. Um, and then you usually apply just plaster bandage because it cures really quickly as your support shell. But again, this is super um, flimsy. I often, when I get this off someone's face, will then take a little bit of the mold material and I mix up just a little extra once I get this off and, and put a little extra around the edge here so that that locks onto my mother, uh, to my mother mold, my support shell. So that almost acts as a key. But I don't do that while it's on someone's face because it doesn't need to be done then. You can wait till you take this off. So here's a couple um, multi-part brush on molds. So I'm just starting to, to work on this of figuring out, normally I would do brush on or uh, uh, yeah, brush on molds just in one piece, but I'm, I'm playing a little bit with making them two parts. So this is a little baby head. So there was a little um, doll head that I wanted to kind of make little planters out of. So I cut the top of the head out and then just put a little cup in here. So I didn't have to like waste time carving a really beautiful center. Um, but I needed, I needed this to be able to be hollow in here. Um, you could make this and cast it hollow and actually kind of jostle your mold around like this, but I wanted it to always be really uniform. So I made this mold that actually has this plug that fits inside of there. And it's got little keys on the outside. Now my key pattern was really uh, uh, even. I didn't realize that until I was totally done. So I put a little notch in here and also in here so that I know what way this has to go back together so that I can find that way. But you'll notice that the that the outside of this also has keys so that those find their way back into the support shell. And then this thing is just cast from the, from the top. Okay. And then the, uh, here's another one of these. So this is a multi-part brush on mold. So this was a, a sculpture that I found at, at a flea market. There was this fish. I wanted to make a whole bunch of them for my yard, but be able to have them hollow and be able to have them light up and I wanted to brush powdered pigments into the mold. So I purposefully made a multi-part mold so that I can have access to the inside of here to be able to put um, powdered pigments on. But this had some, some crazy undercuts. So this has like a big fin here and the tail um, actually is a big V that, that opens up like this. So the tail had to be in, in two parts. So this is just a really thin, again, brushed on mold. And then each part of this had to be the brush on mold part was made and then the support shell was made. This again is the freeform air um, product because once I put this all together, put this back here, when I cast this, um, it's got little holes that, that I put screws in with little wing nuts to hold this all together. But this is really lightweight. So when I cast it, it even has a little rubber plug it goes in the top so that I can fill it, plug it, and then circle it all around to make a hollow casting. So if you want to make something hollow, you want to consider whatever your support shell is um, to be lightweight. Because if it's heavy and you've got to swing this thing around, uh, you're going to get a workout, but it's going to become real tiresome after a little while. So try to make your thing lightweight. You can get machines to do this for you, but most of us don't have the space to have those set up all the time. So this is really great that we can swing them around. Okay. Uh, and then the last thing is uh, matrix molds. So matrix molds are sort of made in reverse. This is gonna be real fast and I promise we'll come back to this in another class. But a matrix mold is made by taking your positive. And so imagine this is my, my positive sculpture. I would secure this to this board, and then I would take clay. So imagine that this paper is clay, and you cover your whole sculpture in clay. And then you basically make your mold in reverse. You make the um, you make the support shell first. So you would take in your clay and uh, either build a little clay wall, or um, when I did this one, I put metal, little metal shims in, the, in what was going to be the parting line of this, and then 
smear this mother mold material. Um, this was something that was a little more like frosting and it's kind of plasticky, um, but it's, it's lightweight. So you make one side and then you make the other side. You make both of these first. Then when this is cured, you pry this whole thing open, you take all the clay away, and then because your sculpture is still attached to your board, you reposition this outer mold and you've also lined this up. And you can see that then there'd be a cavity, a negative cavity in here. And so that cavity is gonna get filled with silicone. So this mold is made to, again, make a, make a really thin skin of rubber to really uh, uh, save the amount of rubber you're using, but to be able to do it in one pour, you don't have to brush this on. Um, when you're doing these, however, because you're pouring this and there's a whole bunch of chances for bubbles and stuff in here, you really have to use um, uh, a vacuum pressure chamber to, to evacuate all the air out of your mold. So we'll get into that in a later, in a later lesson of how to do that. But so you would put both of both sides of your, of your shell back together, you would pour your silicone inside, and you would get this. And this is your silicone mold. When I made the clay for this, I purposefully added this extra line in the back, which sort of looks a little like a stegosaurus. And again, I cut this like a, like a zigzag. But you can kind of see as it gets closer to the inside of the mold, that zigzag line goes away and it becomes a straight line. That's because along the sculpture, I want it to be as straight as possible, but I want this out here to key itself back in. So by adding this extra little uh, amount of clay uh, that then became silicone and gave me something to cut into. Um, so if you know that you're going to have to cut apart a one part mold like this, it's good to add a place that you're going to cut it. But so then this became this. This was actually um, a little tricky because it did have some holes. So I did it to kind of cut around the legs here, but they found their way back home when this is put together. And then this is just all reassembled with the shell onto the board. And then this was actually cast this way so that I could cast this hollow. Now, again, this was a uh, uh, pretty tricky to, to sort of do the dance of swirling all the stuff around, um, but I was able to make the hollow casting that then was filled with foam. So this thing is just a plastic shell that was filled with expanded foam, so really lightly. Okay, I think we're at question time. That was a lot of stuff. Um, so I'm sure there's, there's good questions. So let's see what we've got. Well, it's actually, I think you've captivated the crowd. There's not a lot of, <laughs> not a lot of All questions. All right, well, if anybody has questions there, now. Yeah, so, the, but there are a couple here about ventilation and safety yeah. in your materials. Yes, absolutely. So um, uh, one of the things that you can see is directly above my head is a, is a fume hood. So yes, absolutely. When you're using these materials, you want to um, uh, have good ventilation. Um, a lot of the smooth on ones don't have uh, strong smells, but you should still use them with good air, air ventilation and movement. Um, you definitely, whenever you're using um, silicones as well as casting resins, want to be sure to use gloves. Um, you know, unless it's one of these ones that, that's okay to touch skin, but even when you're applying this, you want to use gloves. Um, you know, prolonged contact to any of this stuff can start to cause allergic reactions. So if you use this stuff a lot, you really want to make sure um, uh, to, to have gloves. Um, if you're in an enclosed space, you want to have a respirator. Um, but a lot of the mold silicones don't have strong fumes. It's often the casting resins that do. So the casting resins and the urethane resins and that kind of thing, um, uh, and, and the expanding foams and that kind of stuff that have, uh, uh, you know, fumes and things that you want to be really careful about. But as with anything, I mean, even just general paint, you want to have good ventilation when you're working with these. The one thing you want to be careful about, however, is, you know, a lot of times you say, oh, good ventilation, just go outside or that kind of thing. Well, some of these things, again, because the, the, um, the mold rubbers and the resins can be affected by moisture, just humidity can affect them. So even just humidity in the air. So um, a lot of folks when they're, um, if they're casting something, a lot of the clear resins and that kind of thing can really react. Um, with moisture in the air. So a lot of folks will be in a, in a good ventilated room, but that's air conditioned so that it's, it's taking the moisture out of the air. So you really have to be careful with that kind of thing. So, um, you know, whereas most things you can just do outside, uh, not always true for mold making. 
There's uh, so a couple of things. Um, one um, question about the most challenging mold issue you have had to deal with. Yeah. Um, so I think the the bigger the, the biggest thing is just learning how to economically make the thing. So, um, you know, when I first started out, I just always made block molds and I just always poured them because it was fast and it was like, okay, you got to figure out the box and that kind of thing. I even, I have an example from a class, but like this was something that we were trying to kind of be economical and make two things at once. So this was a mold of a little hatchet and then also of a crowbar that we were trying to make some, um, some, some, uh, just some foam props, but the hatchet was really skinny, but the crowbar had this big long end. And what we should have done was made this in two parts because this wasted a whole bunch of mold material here because this hatchet, you know, is only like this tall and it wasted all this other material. So um, one of the, the biggest things is just trying to figure out the shape of, of the mold. You know, and we kind of made a real weird shaped box around this to try to like, be conservative, but if I was doing this now, I probably would have done a brush on mold because that would have uh, been better. Um, one of the other hard things is just air bubbles. Um, and uh, uh, it's always a problem and it's always just an issue. Um, and, and it's something that you kind of have to like learn how to deal with and you learn how to use your mold. So uh, whenever I'm making a mold, I always assume that the first maybe two pores that I, that I pull out of it are probably gonna be bad because they're kind of figuring out how to work the mold. And even folks that do this all the time, um, you know, still, still kind of figure that when you're uh, making, you know, you're making your stuff, your first thing might not come out perfect because there might be um, a little problem or you might have a misalignment or you might have to put more pressure when you're holding the mold together and it might um, unseal. So uh, figuring out like how to, how to make my keys really good was, was a big thing. Um, to, to not get like flashing. So flashing is when you make a mold of something. Um, this one's got a little bit on it. So this is like a little leg. So flashing is like, you can kind of see the parting line. Oh, this is white, so you can't really see it. But there's like a little bit up here. And that's like where your material creeps out in between out your, your parting line. And so um, that can just be that your mold isn't, isn't uh, completely connected to each other or that kind of thing. Um, so, but, but dealing with like where to put the parting line and, and where you can kind of deal with, um, you're always going to have to clean something up. Even, you know, like, like I was mentioning, even uh, commercially made things, you can still see that parting line a lot of times. So getting rid of that is really tricky. Um, uh, so sometimes if you can like run it down the seam of something or run it under an arm or, or wherever, like a, a joint makes sense. Uh, but sometimes you have to uh, uh, just know that you're going to either have to sand that away or that kind of thing. So dealing with those kind of things um, uh, has been a has been a big learning thing. And learning how to put in vents. Vents is a, is a huge um, thing that I'm sure we'll talk about in a later class. But knowing where to put where where air bubbles are going to form, and then you can make a little air vent that, that allows that air to escape so that you don't get um, little air bubbles in your sculptures. And that that was sort of the last question. There was how to deal with the ventilation and the combating the bubbles. Yeah, so um, uh, so how do you create a ventilation point? So there's a couple different ways. You can actually buy, um, uh, these are typically called sprues. So it's S-P-R-U-E. Um, and, and so a sprue is something that's letting air out. So for example, like this ax, if I were to pour it this way, well, this tip is like above this point. So I might get an air bubble in here. So we made a little vent they kind of just connected the top of this tip back to here so that either liquid would start flowing into here or as it would come up, it, it wouldn't allow um, air to come out. So if you've ever kind of done that experiment as a kid where you like take a cup and you like flip it over in a glass of water or, and then you can like look in a tub and you can like push it down and that air bubble stays in that cup, that's what happens in here is if, is if uh, uh, the rubber you know can fill up here but you get a little air trap. So um, sometimes I just make these with something thin. This was just done with a little uh, skewer. So, so stuff that's thin and round is really great. So um, uh, little bamboo skewers are great. Little straws are great. You can make them out of little clay worms and that kind of stuff. Or you can actually buy sprue wax. So jewelers sell sprue wax, which are actually these beautiful little wax um, uh, tubes 
you know, that, that you can get in different sizes. So uh, uh, I just finally, you know, like bought a box of them because I realized that I'm, I'm using them a lot, but you can make them yourself. So that's one of the big things. And I think we're at time. Just yeah, right. Yeah, right. And, and I mean, and, and they can be very reliable if you put them in the right places, you know, so, um, but, but know that you're, you're then probably going to have to go back and like clip off the little tip of that sprue or something because it might actually fill with resin. It might work too well, um, you know, so just know that that is something that you're going to have to clean up later on. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, um, Kylie Clark, um, you can e email, feel free to email me or I can find your stuff about your, your sculpture that you're trying to, to do. Um, and uh, we, can, we can chat about that outside of this if you're interested. Um, but yeah, I, I would love to uh, see what you're up to. That would be great. Okay, anybody else? That's it. I think we're at it's time for nine o'clock. So thank you so much, everybody. Um, like I said, this is just the, the beginning of our mold making adventure. So we have lots more of these plans that we're really excited to do more of these. So thanks so much. Thank you, Jen, for so much really clear and helpful information. That was great. Looking forward to further sessions on this. And thanks, Steph, for taking care of this for us. Uh, Okay, folks, grab your Sharpies and mark your shiny new calendars. It is coming attraction time. Looking into next year on Spaminar, and we are reasonably confident that there will actually be a next year. On January 17th, three days before Inauguration Day, our presenter will be Spam member Larry Heyman, Associate Professor of Properties Design and Fabrication and Lecturer in Theater Design and Production at the Oklahoma City University School of Theater. Larry's a veteran of TV and film work, and he's going to talk to us about prop adjacent careers in film, television, and related trades. Then on Sunday, February 21st offering, uh, SPAM member Jay Duckworth, educator, writer, and former prop master at New York's Public Theater, will speak on art and science, the duality of the candle and the mirror a general overview of how art and science have been helping us to explain and understand the world around us. On Sunday, March 21st, SPAM member Mara Rich, prop supervisor at Syracuse Stage, will present Fix It with a Formula, Prop Paperwork, Systems, and Formulas. And on Sunday, April 18th, author, prop master, prop designer, and faculty member at North Carolina School of the Arts and SPAM member, Eric Hart, you all know his name, will give us props you can make at home, which will show us how to make props using tools and materials commonly found at home. He's also going to provide a preview of his upcoming book, Prop Building for Beginners, 20 Props for Stage and Screen, which we're looking forward to. There are more Spaminars currently in development, so stay tuned for updates. You can find us on Facebook at Props for the Stage and Beyond, powered by SPAM. And with any luck at all, next year we'll see, uh, see us all at the Kennedy Center American College Theater Festivals. Also be sure to drop by online at the all virtual 2021 USITT conference. Spaminar is produced by the Society of Property Artists and Managers with special thanks to the SPAM Education, Publicity and Finance Committees. Thanks again for watching. Please keep your suggestions for future Spaminars coming. We want to know what you want to learn about. Now go wash your damn hands, put on your masks, be kind to one another, have some lovely holidays, and prop on. See you next time. Thanks for coming.